<clears throat> All right, we finish up the book of Nehemiah today. It is May 29th, and we are on Nehemiah chapters 12 through 13. So we finish up the book. So talk a little bit about that with some concluding thoughts. So uh, what we get in the beginning of chapter 12 now is a list of priests and Levites. And again, for historical purposes, uh, to know who these people are who are in this pivotal time of history. You certainly need the priests and the Levites. A reminder that all Levites are priests, but not all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. The priests carry out the sacrificial duties uh, and the Levites are temple assistants, for lack of a better term. Um, and so that's what you get really in the first 26 verses. Now that sets the stage then for the dedication of the city wall. So uh, the temple's been dedicated and other things have been dedicated, but now finally, the once and for all, the city walls are dedicated because it's the walls that protect the holy city. And so what you get in the beginning verses is a detailed account of the ceremony who is involved and how they move. Uh, and and you, you have to picture uh, Nehemiah uh, is basically trying to uh, get these two groups to form in uh, a position on the walls opposite of each other. So when they sing, if you will, in worship, it kind of is like stereo. So think about that. Think about, uh, think about a chancel uh, in which is divided with the altar in the middle and the two sections of the choir are singing at each other. Uh, except this would have been outdoors. It would have been a lot more people would have been at a, somewhat of a distance. So it probably would have sounded pretty inspirational. The other reason uh, to go into some detail about this is that perhaps future generations might want to uh, in the future have a commemor commemorative celebration to remember the dedication of the walls and they can reenact this if they want. This is really uh, an interesting uh, uh, text because it gives to us a well-crafted piece of liturgical and uh, performed theology. Uh, and so, uh, and one of the things about this, by the way, uh, in reference to the temple is that pro the prophets later on, we'll see this, we'll talk about uh, the building of the walls after exile uh, as, as a way to then jump off into the future when God will finally make everything right and uh, give us a new Jerusalem and a new holy city and God will be king and, and the wolf will lie down with the lamb. This, this will be seen, this event will be seen as um, a preview of a future event. We'll get to that at times when we get to the prophets. So there's a whole lot of worship and dedication of the city walls. And you again get a delineation in chapter 12 of, of temple responsibilities. Um, and uh, we have to re remember that the governor, if you will, of Jerusalem, he's not a king. Um, he is a, an official uh, appointed by Persia, Zerubbabel. Uh, we'll read about him when we get to Haggai and Zechariah, the two prophets of the, of, uh, the exile. Uh, chapter 13 serves an interesting purpose, a reminder of keeping the covenant and how hard it is to keep the covenant. So uh, uh, Nehemiah um, uh, goes off and uh, he has to go back to Persia. And um, uh, of course the people, the people first or first uh, on the day that is a reminder of the day the book of Moses, the law of Moses had been read. Um, it was found that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be uh, enter the assembly of God. Now, these are old names. These are the names of, uh, of uh, the conquest, the names of Israel in the land before the days of exile, the peoples that uh, led them into idolatry, the people whose influence uh, kept them from uh, keeping the covenant. And so uh, there's a reason why those ancient names are mentioned, because it's a reminder not to fall into that again. Okay. 
Um, and so when the people heard the law, they separated themselves from everybody from foreign descent. And then, you know, Nehemiah uh, has to go off back to Babylon to see the king. And when he returns, he finds that uh, keeping the covenant has not been in, in reference to separating themselves from the people of the land, as they're now called, uh, is not all that easy. Uh, Tobiah, we, we've seen that name. He's one of the three uh, antagonists here uh, in reference to the temple. He gets uh, some accommodations set up for him. Uh, in the temple. And when Nehemiah gets back, he's incensed by this because it means that uh, uh, he's going, he has undue influence and it's not good influence. So Nehemiah basically kicks him out, throws his stuff out uh, and uh, uh, begins a, a uh, cleansing of the temple, if you will, in a sense, making the temple holy again. And then Sabbath reforms. So remember we talked yesterday about uh, the people promised that they would not buy or sell anything to anyone foreign on the Sabbath. Uh, is that just a reference to the, to the foreigner specifically? Does it mean they won't buy or sell anything on the Sabbath? Well, what Nehemiah finds when he gets back is sure enough, uh, the people of God, Jews, are working on the Sabbath and selling and buying to one another on the Sabbath. So they've made an exception for themselves on this. Uh, but of course, the law is directed specifically to the people of Israel. So uh, Nehemiah, um, he exercises reform on that and he orders, uh, he orders in a sense a curfew uh, at night on the Sabbath and so that no one can get in or out of the city gates and nothing can be sold or bought on the Sabbath. And then we finally end with the mixed marriage issue. So uh, we've got some Jews who have married foreign women and their children are speaking the language of the foreign women and not the language of the people of God. How are these generations of children going to worship God when they don't know the, the language of the scriptures and that they don't know the customs and can't participate in worship? And so uh, Nehemiah struggles with what to do with this, but he certainly knows that uh, there can be no more of this. And uh, he makes some difficult decisions on this exclusion of, of uh, these women, uh, these families who, who are not uh, purely Jewish, we will say ethnically Jewish. And so in verse 30, he says, thus I cleansed them from everything foreign and I established the duties of the priests and the Levites each in his work, and I provided the wood offering at appointed times for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh God, for good. Now, I think we, we can't see this, these decisions that Nehemiah is making as without struggle for him, that he really is trying, he's in a difficult spot trying to make these decisions. Um, and so he ends with saying, may I be remembered for the good I did. And if I made any mistakes, if I did anything wrong, may that not be remembered. This is a very difficult time, and it's a problem we still deal with today, folks. Where do we maintain our identity as a group of people, whatever that group may be, and, uh, and, and where, where do we uh, understand that, that that identity is not based on people from outside the group who come in, right? Uh, we still struggle with this problem today. Uh, when it comes to immigration and other issues. Uh, certainly when you read the law uh, in general, there is a great openness to the larger group. The covenant, when we remember the covenant, God is, is uh, founds not just the nation of Israel, but all the nations, right? He blesses Esau with a nation, and Ishmael with a nation, and he's the God of all the nations. And yet in order for Israel in a time of competing gods and idolatries, there's a, there are certain things that have to happen in order to maintain that identity, that integrity. So where do you strike that balance between drawing the boundaries, uh, but, but not making the boundaries into walls uh, that exclude unnecessarily? This is the struggle that Nehemiah has. So 
We want to be careful about judging him too harshly. He tries to be faithful. He doesn't necessarily always get it right. And when we get to Jesus, we're going to find that Jesus uh, has more focus on uh, tearing down the walls than building them up. Uh, Jesus, uh, he doesn't dismiss the importance of boundaries, but he's not going to draw the boundaries where Nehemiah is drawing them, where Nehemiah perhaps had to draw them, even though he drew them imperfectly. So that's where we are on this. And, um, uh, you know, what we do with this material today as Christians uh, is not always easy to know. But what I would say is everything in the Bible must be interpreted through the lens of Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection, his teaching, and his work. I'm not suggesting that that makes everything clear and easy all the time, but we start with Jesus. And then we read everything and see everything through that lens, that lens of Christ. So anyway, that's where we are. We are done with Nehemiah. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for this time. Help us always to exercise good boundaries in our life and faith, because we know boundaries are important, that boundaries matter. But help us to be careful, not in fear, to turn boundaries into walls, walls that exclude unnecessarily. Help us to discern um, in each situation what is the best decision for us to make. Thank you again for your many blessings in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends, tomorrow, Esther.